Thank you very much, both you folks here on person and those of you uh, joining us from Zoom. I'm Greg Peverell-Conti. I am a information services librarian here at the Wellesley Free Library. I'm also the executive director of the Library Land Project. And I'm going to talk about a few things to think about when you think about public libraries. So uh, let me kind of provide a little background. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about Library Land's mission. It's a 501c3 dedicated to exploring, document, uh, documenting, and promoting the role that public libraries play in our communities. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on me, um, talk about what I look for and what I look at when I look at public libraries, and then a few of the libraries that I've, I've looked at. And really, the focus is going to be uh, largely here on, uh, on Wellesley. So Library Land started when I needed a place to meet with a colleague to start a company. And we went to the Newton Free Library. And uh, we had a really a terrific time. And I'll go into some details on that. But what we really quickly figured out was that people don't understand public libraries and their role and the work that they do. And we decided to try to, to, to address that. Uh, this is an old picture of me. This is from February. Um, and my, my friend and then collaborator, Adam, needed a place to work. We, we went to Newton, uh, had, had a swell time. Uh, we started, well, after Newton, we went to the Waltham Public Library. Was we, thought, uh, we thought the Newton Library was great. We were going to go try another library, Waltham. We decided to go to another library a week later. That was Weston. Uh, we came to Wellesley at that point. We did like all the Metro SW libraries. And we started keeping a formal score about what we were seeing. Uh, we started noticing trends. And after about a dozen, we thought, why don't we go to all the libraries in the state? And we decided to do that and set out to, to do it. Um, we also figured out pretty early on, after maybe 25 libraries, that most people don't understand what public libraries do. They have a very antiquated idea. They, they view them as you know, museums of books and not much more than that. Um, so we, we decided to tell those stories and uh, we had an easy hook. You know, we were able to go to the media and say, look, we're these two goofballs trying to go to the entire, all the libraries in the state. Um, here's where we have, have gone thus far. Um, and, we, you know, we talked to, uh, to Boston Magazine. They did a nice feature about what we were doing. We were on Jim and Marjorie's show on WGBH. Every time we got in the media, the story we told was people don't understand what public libraries do. They don't understand how central these are. They don't understand the value they provide. So we used this as a way to tell the story of what libraries are, are doing. Over the course of 2018, we went to 100 libraries here in Massachusetts. Uh, saw a lot, mostly in the eastern part of the state. In 2019, we launched what is now Library Land. Uh, which featured photos, reviews, little write-ups. Uh, we started getting more attention as we talked about libraries more. Uh, in 2019, Library Journal wrote a story about what we were doing. And that led to calls coming from around the country saying, do you want to come and see our library? Will you, will you write about us? Uh, and so it's, well, so we, we went beyond Massachusetts at that point. Uh, and these are libraries we've been to across the United States. Uh, as 2020 ended, as, or as 2019 ended, and as 2020 was getting started, uh, we were scheduled to speak in Missouri and in Indiana, and we thought this is going to be the best year ever. Uh, I was working as a, as a page at the Dover Public Library. I had applied to graduate school, and I thought, what a wonderful year we have ahead of us. Um, one of the natural questions that we get asked, or I get asked, when I talk about public libraries is, which is my favorite? Um, because you know, at this point, it's, it's about 450 libraries around the country, and I've seen a lot of different kinds of libraries, different, different sized communities. So I'm gonna talk about two favorites. 
Uh, the first one is the Boston Public Library. Certainly, I mean, an institution, uh, just a, a jewel in the crown of libraries in the United States. By some measures, the second largest collection in the country after the Library of Congress. Um, they have evolved with the times. They have done really exciting things. I mean, the recent project with the MTA, MBTA to put um, e-books, make e-books available through public transportation was awesome. Their partnership with WGBH, I think, is one of the, one of the best public media inter integrations I, I've ever seen with the library. I mean, libraries are often co-locations for community access television and cable. I've seen it large and small. Bloomington, Indiana, their community access, they have a, st a, a studio larger than this room, multi-level, uh, full-on soundstage. It's an incredible piece of technology. But the GBH integration here allowed two huge cultural powerhouses in the New England area to come together and create a really synergistic operation. And uh, if you've not been to the GBH studio in the Boston Public Library, check it out. See how they're doing that kind of community and media interaction. Uh, they're also the home of the only public library cocktail lounge I've ever visited, uh, in the Map Room Tea Lounge. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But that was put in place to serve and solve a specific problem. Uh, and it has been successful at that. Now, a lot of people, when I say, this is one of my favorite public libraries, they're like, of course, this is, you know, it, it's an institution. It is a well-funded, well-loved, well-regarded library. And of course, you're going to love the biggest, wealthiest libraries. Uh, they're going to be the best. But I don't think that's true. Uh, this is the Garden Grove Public Library in Garden Grove, Iowa. Uh, this is a small community. Uh, and when I say small, this is 174 people. It's a one street town. And when we pulled in, uh, there was just a, a single low slung building that served as both the town hall and the public library. Uh, when we opened the door, when I opened the door and went in, this is who greeted me. Uh, Sarah Christensen. Sarah makes her own clothes. She moved to Iowa with her husband, Gabrielle, because they love the 19th century prairie lifestyle. Uh, they, she writes about it. He builds Victorian bicycles. They have come here to basically LARP, Little House on the Prairie. He's a librarian in Des Moines. She's an author who writes about 19th century prairie life. Uh, when we came in, we asked, you know, what is this? Um, and she said, well, you know, when we got here, the librarian came in intermittently, and he would watch just really graphic war documentaries. Uh, there was no shelving system. There, was no, there were no library cards. There was no catalog. Uh, it was just a, a jumble of, of random materials. And she started coming in more and more as a volunteer and slowly creating order out of the chaos. Um, and the more she came in, the less the librarian came in, until eventually the librarian stopped coming in, and the mayor said, do you want to be the librarian? Uh, and she said, yes. And uh, she, with Gabriel's help, created basically this little library. Uh, so she had done her first program shortly before I met her. And she had 24 people, which is a pretty solid showing for a library program. 24 people in person during the tail end of COVID. But that's in a town of only 174 people. So it was a huge percentage of the community that came out for this program. And the stuff she offers, the fact that this is the only public space in the community meant that there are kids who come here now every day because they now have a place to go. This is just as valuable as the Boston Public Library for the community it serves. And so, you know, I think sometimes when people want to look at libraries, they want to look at sort of the showpiece libraries. But every library has something to look at, something to, to speak for. And, you know, overlooking this would have been a real, a real shame. So, These are the things I look at when I look at libraries. Uh, I look at the place 
that's the physical space of the library, both interior and exterior, as well as the surrounding area. Uh, you know, we're really lucky here because we have Simons Park right next door. Even though it's not part of the library, it serves as an extension of this space, which is a really great thing. Um, I look at the people who populate that place, both staff and patrons. You know, what is that community that uses the library like? Uh, naturally, you look at the collections. This is the reason people come in the first place. Uh, programming, you know, how, how rich, how frequent, how diverse is it? Uh, the community and the services that the library facilitates for that community, either directly or through partners. And then policies, which was something I never thought of in the past. When I was simply coming to use public libraries, I, I didn't think of it. Um, and then when I went through library school, I started thinking about it more. And when I started working in a library, I think about it a, a lot more. Uh, and so that's something else to think about when you think at libraries. Think about libraries. So let me talk about a few libraries I've looked at. Um, so obviously the first impression a library makes is its exterior. And there's no one size that, that fits any community. It's unfortunate here, you know, obviously in the center we have our main library here in Wellesley, uh, and then the two branches, the fells on top and the hills down below. Uh, we have Lincoln here, and then Provincetown, Mass. These are all pretty affluent communities, and uh, I think it's unfortunate. I, I realized it too late to change it, but uh, these are like, beautiful examples of what, of what libraries can look like. And the thing about uh, Provincetown that I really like, I, I came in from the water once about a year ago as the sun was going down, and except for the Memorial Tower, the library is the tallest building uh, in, this, in the city. Uh, and so it, it really creates a striking presence uh, and speaks in some ways to the community's, not vision, but their appreciation and the place that the library holds for them. Uh, the other thing about Provincetown is uh, they have a, a half-scale schooner uh, in the library. Uh, this building was not built as a library. Uh, it was, uh, in the past, a, a museum. and. It, in its role as a museum, they constructed a schooner uh, inside and couldn't get it out. Or didn't want to get it out. It's pretty nice. The exterior spaces, the outdoor uses that libraries can, go, can, uh, can be used for is also pretty important. And we're super lucky here. Uh, on, the, on the left there, you have the, uh, the Fells branch. Uh, fellows from Papa Wheelie's, uh, a local bike shop that we worked with to help promote our library of things, reading to their bikes the book, I Love My Bike. Uh, we have a patio in the center, which extends the children's room here in Wellesley to the outdoors. Uh, it's interesting to see how outdoor spaces for children are used at public libraries, because it really does vary. Uh, we've seen some that are completely enclosed. Um, one of the nicest is the Advanced Learning Library in Wichita, Kansas, that has a, a huge interactive play space that's outdoors, that's partially covered, uh, and it's just really outstanding. Um, Crete, Nebraska, there was a beautiful, uh, again, completely enclosed outdoor space for children. We give children a little more freedom here, uh, and so that patio is, is there and available. Uh, it's not enclosed. Just beyond the patio, we had Simons Park, not part of the library, but part of the library ecosystem that's here in the community. And uh, it's about to become a, a pollinator meadow, specifically focused on endangered pollinators. And so the team has been working with scientists in Western Mass to identify plants specific for those pollinators. Uh, we're gonna be doing a display on, on the evolution of Simons Park in October that will have some books on, on native plants uh, as well as a link to information on this project to put the meadow in place. It's, it's been super fun to watch. And it's the kind of thing that outdoor spaces around public libraries make possible. Not every library has this, but almost every library has something outside its bounds that can be used to strengthen its mission. 
And here at Wellesley, that mission is to connect the community with each other and the wider world. And certainly, the work happening here is allowing that to happen. These are all volunteers working with the Natural Resource Commission to do this work. When I started going to libraries, I was looking for a place to work. And it was a pretty important uh, need. It, it didn't need to it didn't need to be a study room necessarily, but it needed to be a place where I could work quietly. And here are four examples. I mean, on the far side, we have the study rooms on the second floor here at the Wellesley Free Library. Um, those were part of a, a recent renovation, and interestingly, in some ways, they were an afterthought. They weren't a, a primary goal of that renovation, but they are used tremendously. Um, almost as many hours as we're open, we have people in those rooms. Uh, to the right of that are study carrels outside of them that often usually get some relatively heavy use. One of the biggest challenges of library study rooms is the scheduling. It's just how people use them. And I have yet to see a library do that really that effectively. Uh, almost every system seems to have some, some basic problem in place. Uh, this is a new system that Greenfield put in when they opened their new library in, uh, in August. Beautiful, beautiful library, uh, and one I was really proud to be involved with in terms of helping promote them as they tried to get uh, town support for construction uh, in 2019. And then another public workspace, this is in the Woburn Public Library. Uh, this is a beautiful Richardson building built in 1880. In 2018, uh, 2019, they affixed a brand new construction onto the Richardson and created one of the most beautiful libraries in the Minuteman network. Um, just a, a fully restored antique and then a completely beautiful 21st century kind of information focused library. I, you know, people also want social spaces. I think a lot of libraries have recognized that people are looking for that third space and have tried to find ways to accommodate and create that. Uh, on the far side there, that is the Sherburn Public Library. They underwent a five-year renovation. Um, the delay was for all sorts of reasons, but when they opened up it, uh, this summer of 2023, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, I went through with the former director and she was saying this, I said, well, you know, what style would you describe this as? And she said, this is mid-century arts and crafts. I was like, mm, okay, I'm not sure I've heard of that, but it was just beautiful. And they really did put a lot of attention into seating areas and occasional areas throughout the library. Um, here we have the commons, uh, which also heavily, heavily used. And in the center is the, is the tea lounge at the Boston Public Library. Uh, I was the first person in uh, on its soft opening. It, it's just... Uh, a phenomenal space. And the goal here was to attract millennials. Uh, we spoke to the president of the, the BPL, and he said we were trying to get sort of that, that age group into the library, and we realized that we could do that thinking more creatively. And so this, the, the cocktail lounge is only open for a few hours, a few times a week, but it's the after work hours, and it has worked to bring up more millennials into the public library. Uh, and so that's a way to kind of create that social space that also serves uh, fulfilling the library's mission. And it's a really, um, a pretty creative uh, approach they took. And it was, it was kind of sad. Originally, all the cocktails had literary themes, which is natural. Uh, but the, in talking to the guy who put it together, he said, well, yeah, everything, Every cocktail we have is either based on something in the author's writing, or we know the author drank this. Uh, and so it was like cocktails as information bearing objects. It was a really um, like a super attention to detail. Uh, I've since learned that they did away with those when they had a, a refresh of cocktails and didn't do that kind of thinking, which is too bad, but they're still, they're still good. Uh, there are also places to be inspired, and when I started doing this, I was telling a friend about the Franklin Public Library. I live in Medway, and so Franklin's the next town down, and I, uh, it's got a beautiful reading room. Uh, it's just 
outstanding. And I was telling him about all this, and he said, well, why don't you just go to a Starbucks? They're like, they're everywhere, and they're, they're easy, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, on that far end, that's back at the Woburn Public Library, that beautiful vaulted ceiling. Um, here in Wellesley, we have these, this theme of origami of the butterflies throughout the children's room. This is in Littleton, where they recognize that what's beautiful about the, where they are is the, the views. And so they built these huge windows throughout the library to take advantage of it. Um, and so I said to my friend, it's like, which of these do you find more inspiring? Like, for children, do you think this is inspiring or being strapped into a stroller in, car, in Starbucks? Like, there's not really much of an argument there. Um, and I think libraries recognize that there is more than just conveying information, but also kind of elevating the people who come there. And you really see that uh, in all these spaces. There's also places to explore and create and to make. And uh, we don't have a makerspace here, but makerspaces at, at some libraries have become sort of the centerpiece. Uh, depending on the community and the population they're serving. Uh, one of the coolest was in, uh, was in Oakland, California, where they have a scrapper bike library. And th these are kind of DIY custom bikes that people in the community make and race and ride and, and compete with. Um, a kid who was volunteering at the library was really into this, and they built a whole workshop in the library for people to come in and work on their bikes. Uh, it was a really cool way to bring a community in that, you know, teenage boys, maybe not the, the heaviest users, uh, but suddenly there was, was a center for them. Uh, a couple, not strange things, uh, on the far end, that's at the Pepperell Public Library, at the Lawrence Library in Pepperell, where they have a huge collection of stuffed birds um, that were all shot in their community uh, by one kind-hearted fellow and donated to the library on his death. There's about 150 of them. Many of them, I mean, they're all native to Pepperell, all lived there at one point, many of which are now extinct. Um, so it, for better or worse, um, you, have a, you have a reference collection of them today. Uh, this is here in Wellesley where we have uh, you know, a, a concert piano. And you know, this past weekend, we had uh, a piano recital. It's just really nice to have a space to facilitate uh, that kind of creation. And then, you know, we do have Jackie's room. We have a tech lab here, which is really superior. Um, and so that idea of making can be thought of pretty broadly. It may not be the mechanical maker space that you see in many communities, uh, but it is a community here where, where, where arts and technology are, are really facilitated by the library. Uh, the last part about the spaces is about sound. Um, it's a pretty contentious topic. There's some people who still are, you know, really believe in uh, silence is golden at the public library. Uh, there's other libraries where that is not so much the case. Uh, on the far side there, that's East Des Moines, or West Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, just due to the architecture of the library, there are spaces where sound simply carries. Um, and that's something that they wanted people to be at least aware of. In the middle, that's Harry and the Potters. They're a wizard rock band uh, who tour public libraries around the country. And uh, that's them at the Boston Public Library. Too loud for indoors in that instance. And then here at the Wellesley Free Library, we have a lot of quiet space. I love the way the second floor here gradates from conversational at the top of the stairs to, to quiet as you go further back. Um, I've actually gone and measured the sound throughout the library using a, a sound meter we have in the Library of Things. And actually the quietest space is the Washington Street side. Um, uh, at least it has the lowest, uh, the lowest decibel readings. But it's really important to have, I think, gradations of, of sound space so that people who need to have a conversation and need to be social are able to do that. Uh, and people who, are, who need to concentrate and study and stay focused have 
are accommodated as well. Uh, the next thing is people. Um, when we started, when I started doing this, I called this category friendliness, um, and it was, you know, how welcome did I feel when I came into the library? Um, a, a couple of years ago, I was at a library in Central Mass, and I I went in and I was asking questions, and my friend was taking pictures, and very quickly they came and said, no photographs. And I said, so we stopped, and I said, well, I have a couple of questions for you. And they said, well, you need to talk to the director, but the director's not here. And there were questions like, what's the population that you serve? How many people live in this town? Um, it seemed like a librarian should be able to answer those questions without approval. Uh, so then we left, and we went to Charlton. And I don't know if you've been to the Charlton Public Library, but it's a lovely, uh, lovely old building. We went in. I went to the welcome desk and I said, hi, can you answer some questions? And they said, you need to talk to our director. And I thought, oh no, like something's gone really bad in this community. So the director said, do you want to see the library? I just need to change my shoes. And we went through the library together. And uh, when we were leaving, uh, well, we went to the children's room and they had a nice outdoor area. And we came back in, the staff was standing there they were like, we've been waiting for you. We knew who you were. We've been waiting for you to come. It was lovely. But that's the ex experience that everyone should have who walks through the door, that, that the library has been waiting for them, and that we need to make a special point as, as library workers of making people feel welcome. And that is a super welcoming librarian here um, when you come up to the second floor. But you know, you also need to think about things, like welcoming is fine, but you, know, you have to think about diversity. And it's really easy to think about diversity in very simple terms, uh, in, you know, in terms of race, in terms of gender. But I was at a library in Kansas, and I was working, and as I was leaving, I was making notes, and I wrote LSW for Library So White. And I went to the reference to, the, to, I had a question, and the person at the service point was deaf. And I was like, oh, like, this is also diversity. And I, I think you know, when you look at the, the people who are working in libraries and using libraries, you have to think with as, as broad a mind as you, as you can. Um, again, as with looking at libraries, you, to, you can't overlook the people, um, but you should consider them uh, as whole people, not just as this or that, uh, but recognize that they're all. We also talk about things like effectiveness when we talk about staff, uh, about library workers. It's like, can I get things done here? Uh, is there someone to help me not just be a smiling face when I come in, uh, but also be an effective person in terms of getting my needs met? Uh, so collections are obviously the, one of the, the biggest reasons people come to the public library. Uh, we have a few things here in Wellesley. I didn't appreciate how big the collection was until I started working with the collection. It's, a, it's an amazing and large collection here. Likewise, our library of things is something I've been intimately involved with now for several months and can't get over what we have and what we're getting, uh, because we keep adding new items, I think the community is finding really fun. Uh, night vision goggles, we got them a few weeks ago. Uh, we have 13 people waiting to get their hands on them. Uh, so those types of kind of more interesting objects is really getting people excited. And our DVD collection is really uh, pretty amazing. We have a, a large collection that continues to grow, and it's pretty nice to see. But it's not only at Wellesley that have nice collections. This is actually the uh, Performing Arts Library at the New York Public Library. This is uh, uh, when Lou Reed died, his wife, Laurie Anderson, gave his archives, his collection, to New York Public Library, uh, into the Performing Arts Library. So this is actually uh, his notes on songs, uh, on songs he was writing. Uh, it's just a really cool part of the collection. Uh, and that library has just the sheet music section alone 
is probably three times the size of this space. It's just the number of CDs they have. It's just an amazing space for the performing arts. Choreography, screenplays, theatrical plays, it's all housed in this collection. Wait a second, which way am I going? This is unfortunate, I used this picture twice. Um, so this is on programming and I, I think that uh, library program is one of those things that when people talk about you can get everything online, they're ignoring. Uh, you know, these aren't things that can happen online. I mean, they can, people on Zoom, but some of them can't. Uh, this one, for example, in the upper right-hand corner, this is at the Stowe Public Library. Uh, these are new eggs that were found in a vernal pond on the library property that the uh, children's librarian harvested to bring in to a, a space she was working on. Um, it's a really cool thing. I went a few weeks later and some of them were, were, were going strong. They, they turned into whatever they turned into. Um, on the far side there, I only put that picture in for sentimentality. That was, that was March 3rd, uh, 12th, 2020. Uh, it was my last shift at the, at the Dover Free Library, at the Dover Town Library rather, and it was Carnival. And we had a, a performance there. It was later that night that we got uh, at least there at the call that the library would be closing for a few days and uh, we'll be in touch. Again, this performance space, uh, two other performance spaces that are pretty outstanding. Uh, in ben, in uh, Mobile, Alabama, the Ben May Public Library has a beautiful purpose-built recital space. That, that's quite lovely. Um, and then a library that I, I did not include uh, but I think is one of the most important in the country is the, is the Braddock Carnegie Library. It was the first Carnegie in this country. And um, it really, uh, you know, when people talk about libraries and really want to focus on getting back to basics and books, uh, I, I point them to the Braddock because that library served uh, the, the mill workers at Carnegie's first steel mill in this country. Uh, he recognized that it was more than a place for books. It has a swimming pool that was enormous. It had a 1,100, an 1,100-seat music hall with a, a pipe organ with steel pipes, Carnegie steel pipes. Uh, it was built to be much more than a repository for books. Uh, and that library is, is coming back to life after a long time of, of, of work to get it back to where, it, not just where it was, but where it needs to be today. And there's also the services that libraries provide to their community. On the far side, that's the, that's the Natick Bookmobile. Uh, bookmobiles are kind of making a comeback. Uh, you know, Natick has one, Framingham has one. Uh, I was at a library system in, in uh, Ohio, in the southeastern corner of Ohio, where the library was the only institution in the county that people could come and use. Not just in the town, because a lot of the country is county-based. And uh, she said, yeah, there's no movie theaters, no bowling alleys, there's, there's nothing here. Uh, and so they had a bookmobile to go out to, to different communities. Uh, in the middle, this is Rutland, Mass., uh, which is a town of about 9,000 people. During COVID, they vaccinated 100,000 people at their public library. It was amazing. Uh, I talked to the director, and again, this is about community and service. Uh, when they announced the requirements for the COVID vaccine, the fire chief in town said, we're gonna get some of those freezers. Uh, and they did, they housed it, they had the, the, free, flu, the free vaccine clinics at the library and just got a ton of people. This is the Zionsville Library, or the Zionsville Library in uh, Indiana, and it's uh, a nursing station. And it's been interesting to see how libraries handle breastfeeding. You know, some have separate rooms. For those that don't have the space, uh, you're seeing more of these, uh, more of these happening, or uh, not happening, appearing. 
Yeah, that was the, oh yeah, that's the Hussey Mayfield Library in, uh, in Indiana. Um, so the last piece of uh, to, to think about is policy. And it's true that policy is not something that most library users think of unless they, they infract and we remind them of policies because the signage doesn't necessarily help inform people of, of policies. Um, but here's just three kind of examples. Again, uh, they've made uh, this on the far side there, that's uh, Milpitas in uh, Santa Clara County. Uh, in their attempt to enforce policies, to educate people on the policies for using their study rooms. Uh, in the center, this is Walpole, uh, a library built with the knowledge that people were using it both as a workspace and as a social space. And they want to make really clear um, who this library was for and how they were going to approach uh, people's use of the library. And this, I know here we have a, a pretty much a no dog policy, uh, except for service dogs and police service dogs, um, like Winnie. Uh, this is at the Pepper Public Library. This is the director and the smaller of her two dogs, um, who is always, the, the, both those, her dogs are in the library most of the time. Um, I did focus groups for this library, and so many people came and said, I came to this library to have my dog get used to other dogs. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a different approach. It's a super fun dog, super fun library. So those are the things I think about when I think about public libraries. The places, the people, the spaces, the collection, the programming that goes on, the services, the community is being served, and the policies that underpin it and make it all possible. So that's all I have for you right now. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. What made you choose to work here after you visited so many, other than like, you know, uh, whatever. <laughs> like, like what drew you to our library? That's it. You know, I'd been here, this was one of the first I came to when I started. And, you know, I, I, I lived for 20 some years in Natick, so I used this library then. Um, you know, but mostly it was dumb luck. You know, it's where the opportunity came. But once I got here, you know, I, I tell people sometimes, this is, a, this is a, a community of managers, executives, people who, who think orderly thoughts to accomplish goals. And I have been really impressed by the, uh, the way that thinking is manifest in the way the library runs, that it is a policy-driven library where there's a lot of clarity. Uh, and I'm, it's funny, because I'm someone who oftentimes um, is not crazy about policy being very strict. Uh, but as someone who has to help try to enforce policy, I love how clear things are here, that you, you're able to situation, outcome, we, we describe the steps. and. Uh, I really like that. I like the, um, I like the support this library provides me as a librarian to do fun things that I think are going to impact the community. And I've had just tremendous uh, fun thinking of new ways to connect with the community. Uh, and I've been lucky to have, you know, super staff support and uh, super people helping me uh, and accomplishing some really fun things. Now, it's possible there's questions on Zoom. We'll check to see. If yeah, because I, mean, I would really hate it if there's. <laughs> Is this something you plan to like, take outside the US to? Like, are you planning to open 
But, it's funny you said it, because I actually, wherever I go, I like to look at the library. Even if I don't go into the building, if I don't have a chance to, but I like to just even just look at the exterior of it. You, you know, I, I would love to. I, you know, I haven't gone outside the U.S. since before COVID, so I need to. Uh, but yes, the first chance I get, wherever I go, I go to the library. I was, I went to North Adams a few weeks ago to go to Mass Mocha, and went to the North Adams Public Library, which is a, a real beauty. Um, and it's interesting; it reflects the needs of its community. Uh, you know. The opioid crisis is, is big there, and they have free naloxone out, uh, you know, for for any takers. Uh, you know, we don't see that here, but a lot of libraries are, are you know, need to recognize that. Y yeah. No. Wow. Okay. Well, then, in that case. Yes. Well, so we had 11 categories originally. And, you know, they were things like transportation. And we got in trouble, not in trouble, because we were complaining about how terrible the parking was at the New York Public Library. Uh, and people said, but no one drives the, <laughs> that library. Um, so, yeah, we, the, the, I had 11. And part of the logic was so that you would always have a decimal point uh, so that it would seem more precise. Uh, and I worked. Yes, um, how about outlets? How important are outlets in your uh, tier list of uh, libraries? Like electrical outlets? Yeah. Electrical outlets are super important. Yeah. And you know, it's really funny. Like so many libraries, especially older libraries, just don't have much electricity. And uh, you, know, you do see kind of creative solutions. There's a lot of uh, like power towers that you know, will have eight outlets on them, or some of 16 even, uh, that you can move around. But yeah, especially for older libraries, and even libraries built in the 70s, uh, up until the 70s and 80s, because people didn't have personal electronics that needed to be charged. So. Okay, and uh, Rachel, back to your question. So, you know, I wanted to try to open source this so other people could contribute, and it's still one of my goals. But to do it with a score would require that there be some objectivity, that there be some standards that could be applied. Uh, I tried to do that as part of my, my master's thesis. COVID intervened, and um, my advisor wasn't able to, to do that. Um, but then I came across a framework idea, and so I, I, I've replaced that with a framework, and I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants to see it. But it's basically a set of prompts to help people as they go through a library make, like, make sure you're thinking about the different aspects of it. You know, I talked about five or six things here. There's, there's many more. It really is, you know, the exterior experience should extend to how easy is it to get to the library? Is there uh, is there public transportation or parking? Uh, you know, are there multiple entrances? Are, is it bicycle friendly? There's all kinds of, uh, of nuances that when people look at libraries, they need to be thinking about. Yes, Rachel, is this? There's one more. Oh, there's one more question. How do you feel staff pays help with customer service? How does he feel staff pays help with customer service? Because I feel house. Staff days help with customer service. You know, it depends on the focus of the, of the staff day. You know, um, I, I've given this presentation or a variation on this at, at staff days before. Uh, you know, at the Framingham Public Library, one of their staff days was focused on on assisting uh, deaf patrons, and so we had someone come in. Uh, I can't remember the name of the school in Framingham. I'm not going to remember, so I'm not going to try. Uh, but they worked with the staff to create a bunch of a uh, ASL guides with kind of picture graphs, kind of help with basic signing. It was a really very focused addressing the needs of a specific community. And I would say that staff day was really helpful uh, for preparing the staff to deal with uh, and provide good patron support. 
I think here too, you know, we had a recent one on, on kind of thinking about diversity in different ways. I think that was really helpful for preparing the staff to deal with different types of patrons and to think more open-mindedly about the patrons they do serve. And now, unless there's anything else, I say thank you. And we can turn things off. <laughs>